because of the, of the holiday, because uh, it's an old building, and plus the artifacts in here. We don't let the people on, on this side where I am. Uh, the building took 25 years to complete. It was completed in 1732. Uh, I'm in here a lot, and I have to say the woodwork is always impressive. It was all carved, carved by hand. Uh, and the majority of the woodwork, I'd say 70% of it, is original, and about 80% of the brickwork outside is original. It was always a really important building because it was a government building. This was the government building for the colony of Pennsylvania. And your side was for spectators. They had public trials here. This was the highest court for the colony. Uh, about 100 people. Actually, I gave a lot of tours today, and this is the smallest group I had. And the last group, I might have had 75 people. So those are all small groups. So about 100 people, though, could be on your side as far as spectators. Now, the defendant would stand here on the sides of jury boxes, and then the box over there uh, is the witness stand. Now, pretty much any trial I'm telling you, you could think of was here, but not what we're going to talk about. They didn't have treason, being a traitor, going against your own country. And that's really what happened. 56 men, government officials no less, signed their real names to what we call the Declaration of Independence in that next room we're going to visit, the assembly room. You really have to give those men credit the more you think about it because they're not sneaky. I mean, they're all really high-profile government officials. Uh, this is the best way to put it. Everybody knows where they live. And if we lost the American Revolution, there was a big chance of that. All these men would have been arrested, and their trials wouldn't have been in a courtroom like this. Their trials would have been in front of the king, King George III, members of the British Parliament. Let me tell you, um, they would have too much sympathy for these traitors, and they would have been killed after the trials. Once they signed the Declaration of Independence, their families' lives are going to be way different. So I can't emphasize the next point enough. The men who signed the Declaration of Independence, they thought about it for 15 years. Peaceful attempts were made to try to reconcile our differences because war, violence, should be your last attempt uh, to get your message across. So it's complicated, and I want to be fair because we're in a courtroom, and in a courtroom you always hear both sides of the stories. This is what I want to say. Without a doubt, Great Britain was a true friend to the colonists. You know who your friends are when you have problems, they're the only ones still around. Great Britain always came to the rescue. They won a world war for the 13 colonies called the French and Indian War. It was a long war, otherwise known as the Seven Years' War. Everybody living in the colonies, their lives are better because they received protection. But when King George III and the British Parliament check out their budget situation, they have way less money. They get upset, they want the money back. And right away the talk is they're going to have to raise taxes for the colonists. They don't want to be bothered back and forth asking about payback arrangements. They figure they're entitled to tell us how we're going to pay back the debt. And they say, well, they want to get it back quickly, this money, and they're going to tax the colonists on things they use a lot. And that way they won't single out anybody, and they're going to tax people, they'll say, on luxury items. So they're going to tax people on anything sweet to eat, with sugar, honey, molasses, these imported foods that are popular, tea, which is one of the po most popular drinks, entertainment. Well, the people here get angry because they like to spend their money on these things and the prices are really outrageous so they're upset and they can't have these things as much as they did before. And then the government officials are angry because each colony has had self-government here for about 150 years and they don't like being told what to do all of a sudden. All the governments they've created are being seen as second rate so they're paying higher taxes than ever and making no decisions whatsoever. So you heard that catchy phrase. It's a really good one. And there's not a lot of words to it. No taxation without representation. But all the big political events happened in that next room. Can't even believe it. All, all the big family fathers met in that next room. A lot happened in the year 1776. Uh, the votes of place. In the, fir in the first place, whether we're going to break away from Great Britain. The Declaration of Independence was approved and signed in that room in the year 1776. 
Now, the American Revolution, I mean, there are a lot of books on the American Revolution. It's a, really a story in itself. That's why they, the last five years or so, um, they opened up that museum of the American Revolution. It's a private museum on this side of the street down a couple blocks. It's not run by the Park Service. It's a very good museum, though. When you go in there, they give you a two-day pass because it takes two days to go through the, the future museum. I mean, there were a lot of battles during the American Revolution. When you go through it, you realize we didn't really fare so well during that American Revolution. We really lost um, during most of the war. George Washington really went through a lot. He was in charge, charge of the military for over eight years. It's unbelievable he kept that losing group together. He really had unbelievable leadership skills. How did he do it? Well, he was there with the soldiers. Whatever they did, he did. And they respected him for doing everything they did. If it was bad weather, he was at the next tent. And they would say to him, you know, you're George Washington. You don't have to put up with this. You're, you don't have to be out in the thunderstorm. You don't have to be out in this uh, winter storm. You know, if you'll go to a local person's house. And he'd say, no, I have to be where my soldiers are. And when they weren't getting paid, they stayed for him. So he had, a, you know, he had a group. Even though it was a loser group, he had a group, so he had a chance. And he had perseverance, so we had a chance. But we also won a one without France. And that has everything to do with Benjamin Franklin. He went over to France. He charmed the aristocrats there, the royalty. He taught himself French. And he was able to get money and military assistance from the French. And we started to win the battles toward the end. Now, after the war, George Washington graciously handed back his military commission. I mean, he could have said, I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be a dictator. I'm going to be an emperor. Because I'll tell you, after the French Revolution, George, um, I mean, Napoleon Bonaparte made himself emperor. France. I mean, it didn't work out for him. And when he was in exile, he was writing his memoirs, and they asked Napoleon. They said to him, I think you could do it all over again. At least he was honest. They said, Napoleon, um, you would act differently. You know what he said? They all want, everybody wants me to be like George Washington. I don't have it in me to be like George Washington. I do the same thing again. He made himself emperor. I mean, that's just the way, you know, he is. But Washington handed back his military commission, and things aren't going well. They use this Articles of Confederation. It's not working. It's a League of Friendship. Um, they want to run separately, like separate little countries, these the sovereign states. They have separate money. They meet each other a couple times a year to protect each other if necessary. And it's not enough because they have more debts as a group. We owe France, of course, millions of dollars. We owe Holland. We owe Spain. It's complicated. So they come back here uh, over a decade later during a heat wave for what is known as the Constitutional Convention. They asked George Washington, will you come back again and lead us? I'll tell you, he didn't jump for the job because he gave his power back. But he agreed to come back. He was 58 years of age and he really sat in that chair. So we're gonna go over there and you'll see the chair he sat in and he led the convention. So we'll take it across from there. So let's head over to the, the summer. Well, And I must talk Declaration of Independence because today is July 4th. Now, the vote for independence took place here on July 2nd. And you know what happens. They vote break away. And after they vote break away, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who had been asked to write the Declaration of Independence mid-June 1776, because everybody, all the government officials knew he was an unbelievable writer, had handed over his declaration. And he shows all the government officials, like, here's my document. And they all said, you know what, we have to make some changes. And 80 changes were made to it. And like today's you know, July 4th. On the 4th of July, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was approved by all the government officials here. So that's why we celebrate American independence, like today, Independence Day, on the 4th of July. 
The 8th of July is when they tell us in the back here where I met everybody. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is first read publicly. And on uh, the 2nd of August, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is first signed in here. They gave the men a couple weeks to think about it because once you signed, you committed treason. And there was no turning back. Uh, six men were allowed to sign within a year. If you want to see the actual signed Declaration of Independence, you have to organize a trip and visit the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Now, I already told you, like, after the war, they have problems, the American Revolution, they come back here for the Constitutional Convention. And George Washington agrees to return, and he did sit in that chair behind me. Nobody gets close to that chair. Everything else here is period pieces. Some of the things on the tables here belong to the men. I'll tell you, um, right here, this walking stick belonged to Thomas Jefferson. This is the Virginia table. If he brought it when he came here, you never know. But it's nice to have. This little pen belonged to a sign from Delaware. That's a Delaware table. But anyway, what happens here is they try to come up with an agreement how to create a new government. This is what they decided, to have three branches of government. You need checks and balances. You can't trust one person to run everything. They decided here leadership could work. They all were happy with George Washington, but they all agreed. The people of the nation should elect their leader and it should never be for life. But you know, they had interesting conversations here. Some of the men said, once you elect your leader, they should be able to stay until they die. And some of the men said, no way. You might not like who leads the group and you can get stuck, so they should have a set amount of time. And that's what they went with. But they don't solve it all. They talk about slavery. They talk about women's rights. And right away they realize they're not going to be able to make decisions as far as, as a group nationally. And it's time to go home. Benjamin Franklin was asked to write the closeout speech. And he's very practical. And he tells the men at the end of the convention they still have a long way to go. He believes in the Constitution anyway because it's the best form of government they ever had. He's impressed how these men learned to work with each other, that he's a believer he's going to sign. Did everybody sign? No. You can't get everybody. But the majority did, and guess what? I mean, we're still using the Constitution to this day, and I'll tell you why. The Founding Fathers knew there was a lot more work to do. They intentionally, I'm telling you, created a workable government where the people of the present and the future could make changes to the laws of the country. So remember, the Constitution of the United States is a work in progress. But it really started in this room. This room, the Assembly Room Independence Hall, is known as the birthplace of a nation. Now before we wrap it up, look at George Washington's chair. I have to tell you how it got its name. And it all has to do with Benjamin Franklin. When Benjamin Franklin went up to sign the Constitution, because this is the Pennsylvania table and he sat here on the aisle. Benjamin Franklin told all the gentlemen here he was wondering what the artist's intent was when they made that chair. If the artist wanted that carved sun back of that chair to be rising or setting sun. Benjamin Franklin said he had the happiness to note Lenin at the close of his convention that it was indeed a rising and not a setting sun. That he believed Benjamin Franklin there was hope for the nation ahead. So to this day, remember, George Washington's chair is known as the Rising Sun Chair. So that's the story of Independence Hall. So I'm glad you can come to visit today on uh, just July 4th. I'm going to get out of your way, because this is a quick tour, so you can get a photograph. And you'll exit out the front. Um, there is a nice statue of Washington in the front, and I'll stay there a little bit if you want to ask me some questions. But um, thanks for coming. And you take some quick pictures. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Just ask you to take your last photographs, please. Oops, I need you to stay with your tour. You'll be coming across short. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Farther out, because I was in the center. You know, I can hit the. Oh, I wanted to go over the liberty bell before they close.